All right, um, we have hmm, what I will kindly call yet another um, BQE video. And this one, I make some improvements to past implementations, some pretty substantial improvements, depending on your point of view. And uh, we use some of the new TensorFlow quantum noisy features, and we actually look at sort of a real molecule, which is dangerous precedent, stepping away from the ivory tower, not something I like to do. Uh, so get, getting right into it, right? Um, I guess I'll do this even though I have lots of um, content already on the variation on quantum eigensolver, but I'll do a blitz review of it. Um, okay, so we have our Hamiltonian H, hold on, yep. We have our Hamiltonian H that we would like to find the ground state energy of. We know that this is an eigenvalue problem because we have the time independent Schrodinger equation here. So we know that the lowest eigenvalue is bounded by the expectation value of this Hamiltonian. All right, so then if we have this parametrized by theta, we can simply minimize this function and this will approximate E zero. All right, that's basically variational quantum eigensolver. This gives us an exponential advantage because these this Hamiltonian grows exponentially, but we can represent it in the qubit space or the Hilbert space um, in a linear number of qubits, theoretically. Uh, that's the Blitz quantum eigensolver review. Now let's get into the code. And, and like I said, there's like, let me just go right now, I'll look. If I go to my eigen, let's see, I see seven videos. If I just, no, oh, that was not actually it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there's six videos, five in TensorFlow, sorry, four in TensorFlow Quantum, one in Circ and one in Penny Lane doing VQE. So this is something extensively discussed before. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not going too much into the theory. This is sort of very implementation focused here, especially with regard to the chemistry aspects. There's a lot of reasons why I'm not going in depth, but we'll just leave it as, as I don't want to right now. Um, so let's get into the code. Um, we're using open fermion and sort of we're showing how this can be combined with TensorFlow Quantum very easily. Open fermion is an electronic structure package that uh, Google has also put out. Um, it's open source as well. So yeah, and there's also PySCF, which is a, a sort of PySCF is its own Python package that like does um, calculations for quantum chemistry and it uh, it can also be combined. It, there's an add-on for open fermion that combines some called open fermion PySCF. So what you're gonna see here is very similar to something in the TensorFlow quantum white paper, which I have right here um, opened up. It's very similar to section E, subspace search integration with open fermion. Um, we're, we're not gonna do subspace search, we're just doing normal BQE, but we're adding noise this time. I mean, notice the code looks very similar because, well, I also wrote this code, so, um, you know, you recognize my coding style, but we're gonna see this graph right here. This blue line is gonna be pretty much the same. We're not gonna look at this red line though. Um, so for those of you interested in subspace VQE, this is a great uh, resource. In addition, I think I have two videos on it. Also, this code is an improvement if you go to the research branch of, v, of T TFQ. Um, I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of open fermions functionalities when I wrote it, this code, but I am now. So, you know, there's stuff to, stuff to be gained there. So we can move on over. We have our standard imports. 
and we import open fermion and from this PyFCF, all we need is this one function generate molecular hamiltonian which solves our core and electron repulsion integrals for us in this molecular hamiltonian generation um this is the exact same code from my standard other vqe videos i'm copying the the layer definitions for the other hardware efficient onzot sort of approaches to this um, so what what's why is it hardware efficient because it's modeled to be low depth basically rather than modeling after problems so we simple single qubit rotations and c knots um, for each layer in this case we're going to do two layers um, and now here's where an improvement comes in actually later but basically before i have to do a lot of work with the readout operators um, but now i realize that you can efficiently well not efficiently i don't know how efficient it is but easily um, convert the molecular hamiltonians into poly strings that the um, tfq can just read out from uh, so this looks basically the same this is just um, actually looks slightly different because before we had to make a class that inherited from the tensorflow.keras.layers.layer so we had to make a custom layer basically that was vqe but here we can use the built-in pqc to do vqe because our hamiltonian is just the measurement right we can do measurement in a z x or y basis and do some multiplication of it addition whatever so we can just use the PQC to do our whole VQE process. We don't even need the class. For SSVQE, I think you might still, I don't know if you need a class, I'd have to think about that. Um, but for basic VQE, you, you can do it this way. You don't have to do it this way though. It's more rigid this way, so there are disadvantages. Um, and then we also compare a noisy version. Um, and here you can see how easy noise is to integrate with tensorflow quantum um, so we define our circuit the same way same number of parameters same parameter names and everything we add noise in this case um, depolarizing noise with p equal one percent um, and then we just say instead of pqc we have our noisy pqc um, we specify our number of repetitions in this case we're going to use parameter shift rather than adjoint differentiation because um, adjoint differentiation differentiation requires the um, analytic expectation values whereas we're doing these empirical expectation values sample based is sort of a minor determinant on how exactly these um, estimations are derived uh, sample based equals true is, is just more realistic um, so you can see it's basically the same code very little of this is new I'm trying to explain it a little bit just so everyone's clear if you haven't seen anything before but i'm also trying to be speedy so i don't uh, repeat the point but we have our simple single qubit rotations entangling repeated however many times we need to we create that circuit we feed it into our pqc using our bqe or molecular hamiltonian as our readout operators and then we set up our model and we can do that noisy by just adding noise and then using the noisy pqc layer easy peasy um, this is enabled because QSIM has noisy functionality, I, I believe is the addition. So now we have our standard. This is the same code I use all the time, um, just optimizing it. I'm pretty sure this, if I wanted to, I could like cast this and use a function decorator that might make it faster. Um, but that's, I don't feel like doing that. So um, we simply, for each step, Get the energy take the gradient apply the gradient using our optimizer and repeat this process until we either reach 200 iterations or we reach our in increments are small enough that our tolerance has been triggered in this case we're using atom because why not actually in this case there is a reason right i i there's a whole paper i wrote on on that that just came out i also made a video on that atom with 0.1 learning rate is a 10 out of 10 choice right there. So this is a, I'll make a little comment. Empirically, and how do you spell empirically justify? That's a, that's a little shameless self-promotion. I'll cite it. There we go. Shameless self-promotion right there.
Um, so we have our standard, you know, we get our energy. It really should be called guess. I don't know why. I have terrible variable naming habits. So we call it get energy. Um, we minimize that using a gradient. And now we get into the actual meat of the molecular part of things. So in this case, we're looking at dihydrogen. So um, hydrogen bound to hydrogen. This has just two electrons um, because each hydrogen um, atom has one electron and one proton. In the basic case, there's like isotopes of hydrogen and ions and whatever. But the basic case, we're going, we're looking at the bond length and the energy of that bond length as it varies from 0 0.1 angstroms, which uh, there's 10 angstroms in a nanometer, by the way. Um, I don't know the origin of angstroms. It's very painful. I've done some work with molecular dynamics before and dealing with angstroms versus nanometers is, is very annoying. I don't know why they why angstroms are so common. I, I, I honestly have no idea, but this is an angstroms. If you were doing it in nanometers, this would, would be different. So just so you know, um, we're using STO3G, which is a Slater type orbital approximated by three Gaussians. Um, this is not super common and sort of quote unquote real quantum chemistry. You'll see a lot of like uh, C, C, P, V, D, Z, I don't know, the very strange um, acronyms, but this is a minimal basis set. So we as in the linear combination of atomic orbitals, we assign um, one function per orbital. Um, but there's a lot more complex things and, and open fermion support some. This is just a common choice for VQE because it's so simple. Um, it's an uncharged um, molecule and the multiplicity of our spin is one. Uh, so then we keep track of the real energies, the noisy energies and the VQE predicted energies. So now to generate this using open fermion, we specify our geometry, so it's just a hydrogen and another hydrogen um, all in the same plane, uh, just separated by this bond length that we're varying. We use the pi SCF to generate this Hamiltonian. So then we first, we get the number of qubits, and then we generate those qubits. We transform the molecular Hamiltonian into our uh, qubit operators, basically, or in this case, these are fermionic operators. Um, that we have here that we're transforming, um, we get a sparse version of this Hamiltonian and then we solve it using just classical um, eigen solvers right here so we can get the classical eigenvalues here. And then we transform this qubit operator right here to a polysum. So this is a fermionic Hamiltonian that then convert, gets converted to a qubit operator that is now a polysum, which we can then just feed into our, um, our readout operators. So we right, we right here, we just take this transform and directly feed it in. And, and we could do other things with this too. It doesn't just have to be a readout operator. There's lots of flexibility here. So this just shows how easy uh, you, especially if you're more familiar with open fermion than I am, how easy you can integrate open fermion at TensorFlow Quantum. And I guess that was also the point sort of of section E of that paper was the integration. Um, so now we can just optimize these two. Um, really meant for them to have the same initial value. Um, I'm going to change that right now. That's why I enabled it. Finish. Um, but the results you're going to see don't have this. This code does take a while to run, largely, um, almost entirely because of the noisy simulation. I think this code takes on a laptop, just on CPU. I don't know how many threads. Using some of a laptop CPU, it takes about an hour and a half, I want to say, to run this code. So bear that in mind. We keep track of everything, we iterate over it, and then we plot it. So now, uh, I guess here's the, the big reveal of the results. Nice pretty graph right here. 
we have our interatomic distance in angstrom. So this is the distance between the first and second hydrogen. The little line represents the real values um, of this curve. Um, the blue circles are the noiseless, zero shot noise, zero depolarizing noise, adjoint differentiation, optimized VQE. <clears throat> you can see this sometimes happens. This is why I noticed when I was also generating the code for the TensorFlow quantum paper is that it is sometimes dependent on initial ran initialization. Sometimes it'll just be up here and then you run it again, it'll be fine. And the red boxes are the noisy predicted. So you can see how in the presence of noise, this becomes a much more challenging task. And all of these are off, especially passed around this point by just a flat amount that we're not able, that we're not trivially able to just optimize away. Um, so yeah, I, I think this, this is sort of a blitz review. I just, I thought it'd be interesting to incorporate open fermion to sort of touch on that section of the white paper and to integrate noisy, um, the new noisy functionality, not really new at this point, it's 0.5 version that it came out and now we're in version 0.6, um, which is crazy. So yeah, and, and hopefully it can provide some sort of bounding or, or basis for your own experimentations, right? If you're able to do something to change this code and you get all these red boxes to line up, um, I mean, keeping things noisy, obviously, if you can change the onsats or you can change the optimizer or whatever, and all of these red boxes line up with this line, well, that's that's a that's a cool idea right there. That's a good paper right there. So hopefully this can this can help in some way inspire some research. So as always, the code is will be linked. Um, it's it's very simple. It's heavily based on things I've already done. Um, so that's why this is so short. I'm just introducing the noisy concepts and applying it to a real molecule.